Hi everyone, thank you all for coming. My name is Sunila Jakic and um, as Jani said, I'm an intermedia artist and I come from Slovenia. So just a quick background check. Um, I graduated in painting at the Academy of Fine Arts and Design in Ljubljana in 2008. And two years later, I completed the postgraduate program in public art and new artistic strategies at the Bauhaus University in Weimar. And I always been fascinated by the relations between humans and machines, but it's one of the constants in my work. But my view of these relationships is not constant. It has changed over time. And um, I started exploring the issue of automation and how it affects the nature of human labor, first within local manufacturing plants in my hometown, Skopje Loka, and then I continued in intellectual work sphere by posing a question how to measure the effectiveness of the work that managers do before I decided to turn this question on to myself, to my work process in the field of art. Um, I collaborate a lot with Slovenian companies and specialists for mechanical engineering, for software, electronics, drive systems, programmers, workers, and each work in that way becomes sort of an interdisciplinary project. And I find these collaborating environments really important. It's something that remains throughout the 14 years I've been practicing art. But I will start at the beginning, which for me means the end of my studies at the academy. And I viewed the machine then through this prism of kinetic art and rebirth in 1950s. And the technology then was seen as a sign of progress, but not as a means of alienation. And art was supposed to sacrifice its illusions and these preconceived notions of what art is and how it is created. Artists would willingly become a participant, a collaborator in working groups, so the execution of an artwork would not be solely in the hands of the author. The goal was for art to behave like a corrosive element in the society. Is it, do I work okay? I'm, okay, do you hear me? Okay. Um, so, yeah, like an, a corrosive element in society which means basically the agenda was to activate the environment and to activate the people within the environment. And that just uh, spoke to me. I stumbled upon the writings of Matko Mistrovic. He's a member, he was a member of the artist movement New Tendencies in Zagreb, Croatia, then Yugoslavia. And he wrote uh, without conventional prejudice and without personal professional interests. The goal of art is to be like a necessary part of human moral consciousness. As long as there is this impermissible divide between what we are, by no choice of our own, and what we could be. And scientific discoveries or technological advancements aren't really worth much, don't have that much value until they, they are like socially available, accessible, and socially owned. And these writings were important for me then and are still important to me now. So as we look at this image, it might be surprising when I say that I was never interested in machine and technology in terms of innovation or novelty, where like technological imperative would become a quality criteria. For me, technology and the machine had this kind of potential to overcome our limits, to overcome our boundaries, and to overcome these constraints that are imposed on us. So technology could serve like our extension, um, and that's something I was interested in. <laughs> I hope I make sense, I don't know. Um, so. As you can kind of predict, my 
language at the time was full of metaphors and it was full of symbols, but I still try to address our technocratic nature, how we are embedded in these ideological mechanisms, how there is blind advocacy of social norms that is imprinted into our consciousness. And I use the machine as this kind of materialization of energy that could build something but tear it also down. So, as I mentioned, um, I made a lot of kinetic objects and installations, and I usually worked with mechanical or software engineers, programmers, and workers. And these environments, we had so many different dialogues in these environments, because when you can imagine when art and industry come together, and then you're trying to produce a machine, that is completely illogical and weird in relation to how the production process works in the industry, and it doesn't have the purpose as an industrial machine has. So we had so many different conversations with people of various expertise and different areas of work, and I always regretted that these conversations were just parts of my memory and my experience, but that the audience wasn't a part of. So I decided that I would make a departure from this um, idea of, like, utopian idea of machine and technology synergy that I talked about at the beginning, and kind of focus more on the present moment and how technology functions now. So I decided to dissect this background of industrial production that enables modern technology, and which, as you can see, I used in my work. So the first results of this transition were shown at my exhibition that I entitled I'm Spending My Capital, and this work was a part of that show. It's called the friction machine, and it's based on this uh, physical law of friction that happens between interleaved pages of two books when you try to pull them apart. So there is no glue, there's just the, the friction uh, law. And I put that pheno physics phenomenon into social context. So I filmed a video called Four Workers and a Couple of Theories. Now I'll just, because it doesn't have sound, I can talk while you see it. <laughs> so I filmed four workers in their attempt to try to pull the two books apart, one book being Marx Capital and the other one Chris Hedges' Death of the Liberal Class. And during the action, the dynamometer, which you'll see here, um, measured the achieved power of the four men trying to unbind the two books. Now I have to wait for the video to finish. And if somebody wants to stop me because I don't make too much sense, um, I can gladly pass the mic for a question. So the achieved force was uh, 1,200 newtons. And this force was then replicated, reproduced by the machine, which worked with the power of the four men it has replaced. And the mechanism that is built inside the table basically tightens and eases the tension between the interwoven pages of the two books who are bound together by the friction factor so strongly that neither the four workers nor the machine can be successful in unbinding them. 
So now what we have here is words of two people standing up to the machine that has replaced the power of four. And we all know what Marx capital is about, the critique of political economy, where Marx discloses the economic laws of capitalist exploitation, and it's woven together with that of the liberal class, in which Chris Hedges criticizes the liberal class as once having this important role in enhancing democratic rights, but today, due to its co-option with neoliberal ideology, lost its relevant place when it comes to reflection on or struggle for possible social changes. Soon after that, I made Tempo Tempo. It's a double channel video with a kinetic object, and it basically continues my exploration and investigation of the questions of automation, enhancing work, work performance, improving productivity in order to gain competitiveness and improve profits. So what I did was I used archive image from Frank Bunker Gilbert. I have a struggle like to pronounce this name in English. <laughs> um, who was a pioneer of time and motion study. Basically, Gilbert was searching for methods on how to perform a specific task in the most efficient way. And what he did was he mounted a source of light on a worker's hand and by using time-lapse photography got the trail of light which showed the movement of the worker's hand. And then he analyzed it, figured out which motions were redundant, meaning they were a waste of time and a waste of money, and synthesized all the motion into one single, the most effective way of performing that, that task. And I wanted to use this historical example maybe to talk about how Every workplace today becomes an area for this kind of performance measurement, monitoring, and calibration. You have every checkout interaction at target chain that is rated by either green, yellow, or red. And this is by an automated system that shows if some if clerk performed and hit the tasks for speed and accuracy. And this rating is then used to determine workers' compensation. You have badges that are offered by a startup sociometric solutions. And they are basically promising to register the tone of voice, the body posture, the body language, who talks to whom and for how long, so that they can rate their employees. And these devices that are used are a way of ensuring an employer that his employees are exhibiting effective social behaviors. Okay, so I'm not lost. <laughs> and this is not happening in the workplaces alone. We have these new interfaces today that promise to enhance our everyday lives. But what they do in the background is extract surplus value in the form of data. And what we are in today, we're living as these banks of data under the regime of measurement. From the simplistic likes on, on Facebook, which leads to penetrating psychological profiling, and then through analysis go to the models of mass behavior, everyone who's interacted with something online today has interacted basically with a machine learning algorithm. So as tech companies become increasingly powerful, these readings of measure, can tra you can trace back to these historical methods, you know, that were disciplinary techniques on how to monitor, how to measure, how to discriminatory read a subject they were performed upon. 
and I combined the archive footage from the contemporary footage I took in a local factory that makes metal products. And I talked with people who work there because robotization and automation are a part of their work environment. And we, we, we discussed how this impacts uh, their human labor, what does that bring, and I complemented de their statements with statistical data uh, regarding the labor cost and the work norms of a robot and a worker at that plant. I would maybe just like take a second and um, kind of reflect on something at this point. Or maybe, yeah, I will take this after this video. Um, the title for the work is uh, taken from a play that was performed in New York in 1930. And it was performed by a group of German immigrant workers who called themselves Prolet Bune. So the play Tempo Tempo includes characters like a capitalist, a policeman, and seven to 10 workers. And a part of the text from the play is read in the video by an immigrant worker working in Slovenia. And this same part is then reproduced by this kinetic object, metronome, through the sound modulation of a spark. And I will just uh, show you quickly how it works. I have to do this. So it's not too long. before going to this work. Um, what I wanted to kind of emphasize is that I'm always surprised when this discussion or debate regarding the effect of automation and, and its entry in the workplace kind of feeds into these apocalyptic doom, doomsday scenarios. And I was wondering the other day, how come, you know? Why does this happen? And then I think I, I figured it out. Because when you look at the media and how they report on the issue and the danger of automation, they usually use the titles such as, the robots are here and they're coming for your job. And basically, what I want to emphasize is, this is not a decision that is made by a robot. This is a decision that is made by management. And it's a really simple decision. Um, this is one way to put it quite simply of executive class locating new ways to make themselves richer. So it's not some kind of faceless phenomenon that we should all just kind of be submissive to, but it has identifiable actors and who work with really specific motivations. So. I just wanted to kind of emphasize that such phrasing that you encounter in the media helps to mask this agency behind the decision why to displace a worker in favor of a machine. But we know that we are slow and that we get tired and that we make mistakes and that we need time to rest and we need time to learn. But most of all, we need a paycheck for our labor. So it's really kind of obvious that from a certain position, 
displacing a worker in favor of a machine is beneficial to someone. But these systems that are stronger and faster than we are, that have greater en endurance than we do, that don't demand wage labor, that can work tirelessly and increasingly without human oversight and guidance, this trend of implementing such automated and automatizing systems is being accelerated today. And what we know about technology is that what defines it is this exponential growth. But here is where we fail again. We're really good at thinking in linear terms, but we're not that great thinking exponentially. So I think we shouldn't underestimate the force and the speed and the thoroughness with which all of this is taking place. And now I will go to the next work, which is Five Handshakes, um, where I again make some kind of a loop that I know always follows me. If before I talked about uh, the workers' entrapment in the manufacturing process and how his uh, subord subordinate to machinery and norms, I decided to use technology and use this principle of measurement and subject those people who order them in the first place uh, to a test through a single gesture. So I found five managers who for the time being regal free from algorithmic measurement calibration and I measured their handshakes with the use of highly accurate miniature sensors that I attached to the hand of a management board member. I measured the firmness of grasp and the contraction of muscle during their handshakes. But because I'm a nice person, <laughs> I decided to focus on differences, not similarities. So my interest was not in finding the best way of executing a handshake. My interest was to find a human factor in the data I gathered. And here I translated the data after analysis into a series of graphics in the form of abstract diagram lines. And an interesting question pops up. You know, what's more effective, a strength of the handshake or its duration? Because a longer handshake means maybe shows a desire to establish a closer contact. Before I will get to this, maybe just a side note. Um, the 20th century economist John Maynard Keynes coined the term technological unemployment um, in 1928, and he foresaw that society might automate much of the jobs that their, its members depended on. But what neither Keynes nor any other economist foresaw up until recently is not, not only that the process of, of automation would continue after being introduced in manual labor, it would continue to other areas of work as well. So prof professional managerial work now come into range. And many people will tell you that what they do requires judgment, and that's something that cannot be done by a machine. But I read this really interesting talk by this guy, Daniel Suskind, or Suskind, and he said that maybe the question, can machines exercise judgment, is a wrong question to ask. 
maybe we should ask ourselves, what problems does, ju does judgment solve? And why do we need judgment of experts? And the, the answer to that lies in uncertainty. When the facts are unclear and the information is ambiguous, we don't really know what to do. And we seek the judgment of experts to make sense of that uncertainty. So maybe the question we should be asking ourselves is, can machines deal with uncertainty better than human beings? And the answer to that question is yes in most cases. Because when we talk about judgment, or we talk about intuition, or we talk about creativity, these are contaminated words. Because they, we ascribe them to human way of doing things, human cap capabilities. But machines perform these tasks and are increasingly capable, but they perform them in different ways. Because there was one example, example that I found, and it's this algorithm that was supposed to minimize the difference between correct answers and its own answers. And what the algorithm did is it found where the correct answers were stored and deleted them so it would get a perfect score. And for me, that's you know, brilliant. This is an example where I don't, I don't wonder about machine emulating me. I want to emulate the machine, you know, to, to act like this, to act subversively in my day-to-day -day life. I'm just skipping through a lot. So as the current wave of pervasive automation and the ever fasting development and use of algorithms of prediction radically reorganize and transform all forms of labor, and as delegation of tasks to machines becomes widespread, my starting position in the latest project was to explore the possibility of machine-conceived exhibition. So my question was, can my labor as an artist be automated? And if the answer to that question is yes, to what extent? So this work is based on programming a predictive algorithm that would conceive an artwork for me. And I work with two guys from the Faculty of Computer and Information Science in Ljubljana. And we built this predictive algorithm, which is based on my past artworks. And there are many ways to distill something into data points. I converted my labor as an artist, that means my work, my interests, my questions, my research, into data points. And as data, each feature of an artwork becomes a table of numbers and each creative decision becomes a row of digits. Then I turn the decision making over to the predictive algorithm and it sifts through this data set and it identifies patterns. So what has through time become increasingly important to me and what I have abandoned. And then it determines the content, the aesthetics and the technical execution of my next artwork. The data set contains uh, 500 parameters after many cut downs and conventions. Um, what is a parameter maybe? It's a concept, it's a password, it can be a content or technical term that is evaluated. And I took parameters out of descriptions of my work, out of technical writers, texts from critics, text from curators, articles, basically everything that was written about my work besides the research I did at various time periods. And I wanted to kind of still make the algorithm present at the exhibition. That's why I, I made this bar or a strip that is nine meters long and it shows the data set for the algorithm. So the, these 10 upper sections belong to each particular artwork that I made, and some of them you've seen at the, during the presentation. And 
each section is divided into small segments. And this segment shows the presence of a par parameter in a particular artwork. And the lower, wider, green bar is the result. It's the prediction that the algorithm made. This is me pointing to the prediction. <laughs> so yeah, maybe I will stop here. The prediction can be read in two dimensions. So the width of the column basically shows the presence of the parameter in the next future artwork. And the filled part, that is the non-shaded part, shows the level of conviction the algorithm has in its prediction. So these are the two things that I had to keep in mind for the realization of the future artwork. And the digital punch card is the work based on the prediction the algorithm gave. And it depicts a fragment of the invisible online global workforce that performs tasks on crowd-based platform called MicroWorkers. The users were asked to download and install an app that tracked their, the timestamp of their work and mouse clicks and key presses while they were working on the platform during a 24 hour period. And this fragmenting of jobs into outsourced tasks and dismantling of wages into micropayments sets up one of the most unregulated labor marketplaces and is also directly linked to the principles of scientific management. Scientific management is one of the parameters that the algorithm predicted to be crucial and essential for this work. So I gained a large body of data and on the basis of the obtained data and kind of taking to into account the formal parameters that the algorithm highlighted, the formal parameters were use materials such as wood and glass, put it in a frame, replicate small movements, use data collection and data processing, the number and type of screws I should use, the number of monitors, the installation mode should be mounted on the wall. This is all I had to, the instructions I had to follow um, to produce two data-driven line drawings and two animations. And I'm sorry, this image is not really clear, but maybe the second one will be. So this data-driven line drawing shows workers on the platform that decided to participate in the measurement of their work. And the length of the line shows the intensity of their work in the, on the platform. The lines going downwards show when the work needed um, mouse clicks and the changes in angles when the work on the platform demanded some sort of typing. I see I selected 49 users out of 280 participants and I kind of selected them and showed their username the username that they chose the geographical location and age and gender then the two animations I will just show the first one. The second one. So this animation is based on a drawing number 118 by an artist, Sol Levit, with the instruction 50 randomly placed points connected together with straight lines. But what I did was each of these points, there are 49 here, represents somebody who works on the platform. And the connection in the form of a straight line 
is a representation of a synchronized moment when two people on the platform perform the exact same working gesture on two geographically distant lo locations who are unaware of each other's existence. It's funny because when I was um, searching for collaborators like to make this uh, algorithm, to build this algorithm, I had a conversation with one guy who's a specialist for, a specialist for AI. And he, we were discussing how during the process of its making, the work already influences you. And I see how this happens because people who work on these platforms they do similar tasks as what I was doing when I was building the, pr the data set for the algorithm, which is data preparation, data entry, and data categorization. And the other thing that connects us is the precarious nature of our labor. So, I also made a series of photographs. It's uh, 190 uh, photographs that show workplaces of people um, who work on the platform. Um, I created a site and on the site I uploaded my workplace and asked people if they would take photos of their working environments, tag them with the object that is most personal to them and upload them to the site. I labeled each photograph with the name of the user and how, where they're from, how much they've earned on the platform in total, how many tasks they've done, and how much they were paid per task on average. Which brings me to where I am now. Um, what I realized while doing the preparation and the work for the, the algorithm and seeing the results is that predictive power is still limited in its forecast of the future output because it's um, quite obvious really. It makes a selection from among ready-made choices. And it may be an original selection, but it's still weighted down in the past. And this is really important when you implement such technology into an environment that has social consequences. And when you kind of want to create, like, create a new choice, it's not really possible when it's heavily constrained by choices that came before. So to put it in, the, in this context, in the context of the gallery, conceiving artworks from the same conceptual depository isn't really imagining something new, but it's a narrow alteration of existing input. So what I decided was, in this final stage of the project, which I'm developing now, is to give the machine an early look at my contemporary investigations. And this will be an early window into the present disor disorganization of my thought. You know, I have not yet made a decision. And this is where the algorithm enters. So it will determine tomorrow's artwork based on observations today with the past flickering in the rear view mirror. Because we like a little mess. You know, we like a little mess because we are a bit of a mess. You know, we change our minds, we get interested in new things, hopefully. We kind of, you know, there's this question of, sometimes I think we don't want that many choices, but then we bristle when we have only one choice. And I think it's, kind of interesting to ask ourselves 
When do we want to be freed from the burden of choice? And when do we want to be capable? Or when do we want to have an opportunity to make a choice? So this is what I'm exploring at the moment. And I will maybe end with a quote from this guy that uh, I found online recently. So I won't pronounce his name correctly probably, Dan McKillian. He says it's mathematically impossible to, to design an algorithm to be fair to all groups. You know, because these predictive algorithms are used in policing, there's like Pratt pool, you know, this futuristic pre-crime um, idea. But what happens is, like I said, and I found out in my work, is um, the data that is, that the algorithm acts upon is the data that is full of systemic poli police practices that have marginalized ethnic minorities for de decades. So we have corruption in the data. And then if you insert inequality in data, you can't expect nothing else but to receive inequality in return. And this is what we call a feedback loop. So when we feed machines with data that reflect the history of our own unequal society, we are in effect asking the program to learn our own bias. And as an ending thought, his words. If we want the voices of the users to be heard over the hum of the data centers, they have to be there from the start, putting their experiences along the generalizing abstractions of the algorithms. If our subjectivities are co-constructed co with the tools of our time, we should ask ourselves how these new forms of calculative cleverness can be stitched into techniques of empathy how can we put ways of caring into computation? So this will be the end. And thank you for, you know, paying attention. I would also like to thank uh, Nieme and Axioma for the opportunity to talk here and to present here. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.